All right, everybody, welcome. If you're here for the webinar on new innovations in COVID lab testing, you are in the right place. We're going to give everybody a minute to go ahead and uh, enter the room here. I see pile, people piling in. Um, we appreciate you attending, as always, um, this session. So we'll be getting started and kick off in just, uh, just a minute. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are at the Lighthouse Lab Services hosted webinar on COVID innovations or innovations and advancements in COVID testing. Uh, this is a free webinar that we put on to hopefully bring valuable information to people in the clinical diagnostic laboratory industry. Um, we're always trying to keep our eyes out for what's new, what information we think that our our customers and clients want to hear about and just things that we think are cool. So today's an exciting one. Um, I think people are probably getting tired of hearing about COVID testing. So we're hopefully going to bring you some things that are newer and uh, are not the, the same thing that you've been reading and hearing about for the, the last six months. And so we're, we're going to try to highlight a few of those things and see uh, if there's a way for you to incorporate those or at least give you some resources if you'd like to um, try to take advantage of some of this uh, innovation that's available and out there. Um, we will have some polls going on throughout it. I have one pushed out there now for you guys to respond to. Um, how long do you think this COVID testing is going to be in high demand? It continues to, to hang on. And I think if uh, any of us were to speak to ourselves six, seven months ago, I, would, I know at least for myself, I wouldn't have thought that we would still be uh, having COVID dominate our conversation and I, I think it looks like it's going to continue to do that for um, the foreseeable future, the, the winning vote getter so far that it's going to be a major piece of lab testing for more than the next year. I don't disagree. Um, and so hopefully some of the, the topics we cover today will help you uh, position yourself, your lab, or um, give you knowledge about what's available in terms of COVID testing that you might not be aware of or um, would like some more information on. Um, so I am going to be presenting along with um, Joe Sgirza as well as Pat Weinart. They're both going to be talking about what their companies do in this area. Uh, we're also going to talk about a uh, new offering that Lighthouse has put out, and I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll get started with that. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we do that is that if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A section. It's on the right side of your presentation of the slide deck. You'll see Q&A as well as chat. Um, you can use either of those. Q&A is probably the preference because that's going to allow us to thread and keep um, those responses uh, linked to the questions. Uh, we will allow the presenters to answer those questions at the very end. We'll do some Q&A, um, and they might field those throughout the course of their presentation as well. I also wanted to call your attention to the handout section. So if you click there, you'll see some downloadable PDFs that go along with this presentation. So if you're looking for more information on any of these, you'll be able to do that. We will also give you the opportunity to respond should you want to um, speak with the presenter or their company in more depth um, after the webinar. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to talk about Saliva Now. So Saliva Now is a PCR-based uh, COVID-19 test that we've been working on and have engineered here at Lighthouse for our customers. Um, Part of the, the reason we went um, through the, the hoops to do that was we were seeing just the supply chain pinches that, uh, that were occurring. It was difficult to get consumables um, at times for a lot of our customers. So we wanted to have our fate in our own hands for the labs that we manage as well as for our customer labs. And so um, we've been working tirelessly and thanks to um, a few of the smart uh, PhDs on our team, we're able to come up with uh, a more efficient extractionless saliva uh, offering. And so we're making that available to others as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, a saliva test 
is got several benefits over the traditional swab. I'll go over those now. Ease of collection being the most obvious of those, right? So I don't know if anybody's had a nasal pharyngeal swab or been uh, poked in the brain with going through that process, but uh, spitting in a tube has been better received by pretty much everybody that we talk to. Uh, we're also continuing to make improvements there and adding a funnel to the top of those tubes and just trying to make it as easy as possible for a specimen or for a, a patient to provide a specimen for that testing. And we feel like that's going to be game changing. It just allows for self collection. You don't have to have as highly a trained uh, person out there in the field doing that swab. And I think that unlocks a lot of potential in terms of um, servicing, you know, employer groups or maybe some of those asymptomatics that might want to provide their own sample. So I think ease of collection is a big one that also has less moving parts in terms of the supply chain. So you're not at the mercy of any one of those links in the chain breaking. And so I, I think there's a benefit there. Uh, another benefit is the improved turnaround time. You know, by removing um, the extraction step, this is an extractionless process, um, you're saving some time, you're saving some labor, and even more importantly, you're saving some costs, right? So we're about 30% faster um, by removing the extraction, and uh, the average cost per test is two and a half times lower. So it's really a win-win in all areas, in our opinion. You know, it's easier to collect, it's cheaper to run, it's faster to run. And uh, finally, we see uh, earlier results as well as improved detection. So really checks all the boxes all around. And uh, we, we feel like that's just a, a no-brainer for labs. If you're interested in that, we do have that available pricing starting at about $13 per test all in for that. And we'd be happy to talk to anybody that's interested in hearing a little bit more about it. What we offer to supplement that is if you're a lab that's already running testing and you want to switch over to, um, to doing saliva or some of our other assays, um, we may be able to assist with validating that at no cost with a commitment of some, some sample volume. We're happy to do that. Some of the other services that we provide to supplement that, if you're looking to get into the game and you need a lab director or you need to get the test validated and, or just need to set up a new lab from scratch, you need to recruit some scientists to uh, be able to run the test for you, we're happy to help with all of those things. And so uh, just reach out to us, let us know, and um, we'll set up a call so that we can go through uh, the different offerings and different ways that we can get you started, hopefully save you some costs and give you a uh, competitive market a advantage over your competitors out there. Um, so there's a, a pop-up on your screen there you can respond to if you want to hear more about the saliva test, and we'll have one of our business development reps follow up on that. Additionally, we do have the saliva now. We also have a swab base. If you have customers that are already on swab and you're not looking to make a change and you want to stay there, we do have a swab-based solution that is cheaper than the major manufacturers. So if you wanted to look at keeping your current workflow and not making any big changes, but just save on consumable costs, we can help there. And then we also, also have a multiplex assay that is flu, A and B, RSV, and COVID all mixed into one. It only takes one well. If you're running um, you know, a Quant Studio or something similar to that, it can all be multiplexed into one well, can run um, all of those tests together. And I think we'll have a really nice cost savings. And that also does give you the ability to maybe take those COVID negatives when you get a response. And if uh, the physician wants to do some further testing for uh, respiratory flu, um, you're able to, to go ahead and run that test for those as well. Um, and we've seen the reimbursement guidance on that and can kind of help provide the appropriate and uh, compliant way to approach that market. So let us know if that's something that um, you're interested in or we can assist with. Um, some other things that we're going to be talking about today, I want to uh, bring up mobile testing. So that's something that a lot of people are asking about. Not a lot of people know how to execute on, right? So how do we get COVID testing to the people that need the testing, especially in those unique situations where a rapid result maybe is needed um, or you can't have all the patients come to a clinic or maybe just for, for other reasons you want to get onto a movie set uh, we've seen that be a solution. You need to get to a sporting event, a convention, something like that. As we start to look at what this new normal looks like in uh, 2021, I think there's going to be more and more need for agile uh, COVID testing solutions. So I would like to introduce you to Joe from Integrum Scientific. 
And uh, Joe Scherza is the CEO. He brings 30 years of experience in clinical research, global infectious disease operations, developed his company with a focus on improving preparedness in areas prone to infectious disease outbreaks, speedy responses during those outbreaks, and improving the long-term global health and clinical research infrastructure to combat uh, future outbreaks. Within a record-breaking four weeks during the height of the 2014 Ebola outbreak, he and his multidisciplinary team were able to design, build, and deploy three innovative mobile labs that launched the first clinical trials in West Africa during the outbreak, providing much of the treatment and hope that that population needed when they were hardest hit. So Joe is going to be speaking with us about their mobile testing lab and the advancements they've made in COVID testing. Uh, to make that more widely accessible during this outbreak. So I'll hand over the mic to Joe so he can tell you a little bit about Integrum Scientific. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Joe Skurz. I'm the CEO of Integrum, and uh, I appreciate the invite, John. Um, I wanted to just uh, talk in uh, the, the next slide about the uh, Infectious Disease Advisory Board uh, and what they bring to the table. Our, our company is de designed uh, in a very unique way where our infectious disease board is located in many ports, parts of the globe that um, the equatorial regions and hotspots of infectious disease usually crop up. So we designed it in such a way that we have these sentinels, if you will, that are alerting different types of uh, infectious disease, such as back in 2014, which we where we uh, we had the idea for the Ebola crisis uh, when when as John spoke about, um, and what this um, organization has is is like I said quite unique. We're able to um, pull into these folks, and these folks are both government and acad academicians as well as uh, folks from uh, that are working in the warp speed uh, project. And uh, right in our back door, it's not Ebola, which we had thought we'd be uh, sending vehicles um, to uh, Africa and many parts of the globe. Um, here it is, we've got COVID right in our back door. And we had to, uh, again, go back to the infectious disease board that, that really is the brains of, uh, of Integrum. And what we did with operational folks, um, as well as uh, our, our, our leadership team, was to come up with COVID uh, uh, vehicles that are um, able to get to other locations uh, than, that bricks and mortar just can't reach. And as you know, in the US, uh, you could go to the Upper Peninsula of uh, Michigan and you'd be hard pressed to find uh, testing as rapidly as you would say down in a more uh, um, urban area. So what Integrum basically has done is you can see these three labs in the, in the picture uh, as an example. We're not going to replace bricks and mortar, of course, but we're really to strengthen it and augment the uh, hospitals, the research settings, as well as what uh, John had said, they, they offer a, a, a nice um, alternative to uh, having people come into the hospital because, as you know, many of the folks are, are skittish even getting a test, yet alone a nasopharyngeal swab as you talk to uh, um, tickling your brain. Um, the, you've got to look at the patients themselves. And I think these laboratories function very much like the bricks and mortar. And we offer um, a, a nice, unique setting where patients, whether it's saliva or it's a, a nasal swab, can um, come to your location um, and you'll, you'll be able to do a one-stop shop. M many people offer these uh, labs as testing labs, but they're really just collection centers. And then, then they actually offset and bring them over to the bricks and mortar. This is very different. As you can see with the, uh, the vehicle, uh, the blue vehicle in the, uh, in the picture up top, that is uh, a typical laboratory that's got uh, one, two or three uh, technicians in there with uh, uh, class two biosafety cabinets, as well as other um, uh, RT-PCR testing that you would need. It has, uh, and I'll get into them in a minute, all the redundancies that you would need uh, with connectivity as well as uh, power supply. And then down on the left-hand corner is our flagship vehicle. That is a biosafety level three plus uh, vehicle that um, has been featured in a, a couple of uh, uh, locations that can actually uh, fit on a C-130. It's much more robust than what we need for COVID testing, 
but uh, I thought we'd just mention it there because it's uh, quite unique. It's very rugged. It's four wheel drive. It's got many different redundancies and uh, it's got a pneumatic uh, patented uh, top that goes up and down so it can actually fit in uh, several aircrafts if, if need be. And then to the bottom right, I think is quite unique. Um, it's really a pod. So um, many folks were trying to develop and they have um, just very uh, inefficient with no R value, uh, big containers, if you will. This, um, thanks to uh, our partners in Greensboro, where are headquartered, which is Matthew's Specialty Vehicles, uh, they were able to develop these pods that have um, COVID friendly, if you will, laboratory setup, very much like the other two that you see on the screen. And uh, the difference is, is these can be customized very readily. They're um, uh, much more efficient in terms of the cost. And uh, you can, again, not only customize them, but they have a nice R value for your HVAC and uh, for heating and cooling, depending where you're gonna uh, put these on, on site. They can be easily uh, flat bedded and put next to a hospital or research setting. And they are, um, uh, just a, a cost-effective way. So I think that's a, uh, a value add as well as the, uh, the speed, since they don't have an engine, um, we can actually put them together uh, in weeks uh, versus months. And the next slide is basically the, uh, uh, the inside workings of these laboratories. As you can see, there's a, uh, a hood there. Um, there's a few pieces of equipment we've just shown you. And you can see uh, in, into the uh, uh, the guts, so, if you will, of the of the mobile units. Um, there's a lot of consumable space up top. It looks very much like a cubicle uh, where we've put these locked storage cabinets. Uh, there's a pass box down below for the samples, so the people that are outside, say in a tent, that you can actually get um, these uh, these samples to the uh, the laboratory technicians very quickly. And there's redundancies. We have minus 80 freezers on them. We have refrigerators and our backup generators. I'll, I'll get to, to in the next slide with the, uh, the, the other functionalities. And for this slide, um, I, I, I put it in so you can actually see not only that the, in, the, in the bottom right, the power and communication where you've got the battery backup, but you can also hardwire this in to shore power and um, to the uh, the left hand side, um, you can actually see inside a research vehicle. Um, so it's again, we we Integrum realizes that not only both the clinical research setting and the clinical setting is really what the audience is here. So we want to make sure that uh, we're we're able to uh, discuss both, and we really would like to engage if you guys were interested in finding out more about these. But I I think. Um, if uh, I think I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty, if maybe John, you can get back. I can hear you all right. You can. Yeah. Okay, great. You want to go slide forward? Yeah, that would be great. There you uh, go. Actually, backward if you could, because uh, there we go. Yep, there you go. So, um, so as you can see, some of the features in here um, are... Uh, you know, the 24 by seven support, which is something that I think is very unique that uh, we were able to do with our operations uh, folks here. Uh, and I, I want to applaud them by uh, saying many of the, the uh, power redundancy issues and, uh, you know, there's always going to be um, equipment and calibration issues. And thanks to Matthews, we've built a 24 by seven support. So when you have these vehicles, whether they're in Africa or in the US, um, we're able to put, uh, not a, I wouldn't say a Six Sigma, but we're able to actually get the entire um, vehicle and support system um, communicated via phone or, uh, or by, uh, by Zoom or Skype so that we can get supplies out. And the Infectious Disease Board is comprised not only of scientists, but of engineers. And we also have uh, Linden Transport that's able to get any of our consumables, or let's say it's a generator issue, and we can get them not just by a FedEx, but actually by the, uh, the Linden Transport uh, International folks that can get uh, anywhere where we need in less than a day, day and a half, uh, if it's a, a major lift. So I think it's got, um, quite a few features um, that uh, would augment and add to uh, any research setting. Um, we have these available in the US now. 
we've deployed probably about 20 of these already um, for the, the, the research setting. And um, we, we look forward to talking with you folks. And the last slide, uh, and then I'll just bring it back to you, John. We were featured at ASTMH at TropMed last year um, that they thought it was definitely a game changer. This is our flagship vehicle. And um, I'll just close with, uh, we were uh, interviewed a couple of weeks ago on 60 Minutes uh, where Dr. Cordopeter, who's one of our board members, um, was interviewed. They're doing a piece on the DOD. So uh, it was kind of nice to see that people are uh, seeing that having wheels and mo mobility really makes a difference so that you can get to California, if you will, or if you need to be, like you said, a movie set or on site. Um, you've got uh, a one-stop shop and you can get these tests uh, more readily and the turnaround time uh, is, uh, is, is quite remarkable. So with that, I'll turn that back to you, John. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. That's awesome. I love, I got to tour one of these. It's super exciting to, to see a lab uh, contained in that amount of space. It also shows you what you're able to do with, um, you know, 50 square feet. Uh, so it, it's incredible what you guys are able to pack into those. What this means for you guys on the call, if you are in a lab that's already existing, this can be attached as your CLIA. On the CMS 116 Section 5 area, you can add a mobile um, solution or a temporary site. And so this would just attach directly to your CLIA. Um, we're able to deliver this for about $100 per test, and that's all in with staff with supplies, with equipment, everything. And so you guys can then mark that up. And so for normal, you know, federal payers, maybe that doesn't work. But if you have a group that's willing to cash pay and maybe pay a little bit of a premium in order to have testing brought right to them, you guys would be able to mark that up and take the difference. And there is potentially some discounts for scale there, depending on the uh, the amount of samples that are coming through. But I think it's a really interesting solution. If you're an employer or a group that does not have a CLIA, we can uh, we can file the CLIA and then attach this to that. Um, but there, there's a couple different ways that that can work out and uh, options. I just think it's great to have the availability to mobilize that solution and put it where the patients are if you have a need. We wanted to make sure that you guys were just aware of that. And so on the screen there, you'll see an opportunity to respond if you wanted more information from Integrum on that uh, mobile solution. Go ahead and uh, indicate that there. We'll make sure that somebody reaches out to talk to you about that a little bit more. The, the next presenter we have is Pat Leinart. Pat works for Lineco Technologies. Lineco was started in 1992. They're a biotech manufacturing company. Um, and they have a focus on antibodies is one of their big focuses. And I think that the need for antibody testing is going to be huge in 2021. I don't know if anybody else saw the Wall Street Journal article um, from, I think it was yesterday, the day before, that measured and said the presence of antibodies in COVID patients starting to drop over the course of a couple of weeks. And I think that a vaccine Hopefully we'll, we'll be showing up here uh, at some point in the foreseeable future. And part of that will, will be a need to measure um, the, the level of antibodies that people uh, have in their system to be able to, to be resistant. And so I, a lot of that science is still ongoing, but I thought it would be really good to bring you guys this, uh, this test that you'd be able to add into your laboratory, which you know, might be might be the way that you guys need to pivot. I know it's been a lot of COVID testing so far. I think that will still continue for the foreseeable future, but I think there is going to be a pivot at some point once the vaccine shows up. And I think that pivot may very well be into antibody testing. So I want to give Pat the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about his company and about um, the test that they've developed um, that, that helps accomplish that. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Pat. Okay, thanks, John. First of all, I'd like to Thank John and the Lighthouse team for the invitation to present ImmunoRank. Um, it's a, a new uh, assay that we've actually been working on for probably four to five months. Um, and it detects, it's a surrogate neutralization assay that detects the SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies. And um, if we get into the presentation here a little bit, um, well, First, let me tell you a little bit about our company. Uh, we are a, a full um, research and development and manufacturing biotech company located in the St. Louis area. We're uh, 
uh, have a facility about 30,000 square feet where we're able to manufacture. Um, we're very heavy in proteomics, so we're able to manufacture recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies um, very rapidly and at large scale. Um, these uh, are used a lot in research, especially in uh, medical research, but they're also used as components to the diagnostic test kits. Uh, we, we're really well known for our preclinical therapeutics, quality antibodies, uh, but we also um, offer services such as uh, assay development um, on a number of different platforms from uh, ELISA fluorescence, chemiluminescence, absorbance, to flow cytometry. Um, those are the main platforms that we work in. Uh, we do a little bit with lateral flow rapid, but um, mainly these other platforms. This is the test this is one of our antibody tests. We have two. One is a traditional serology test, although it's a little different because it uses the receptor binding domain as the capture anti antigen. But this is the test here called Immunorank that we're featuring in this presentation. Um, it's a semi-quantitative surrogate neutralization test, which um, allows you to test either plasma or serum for the presence of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies. Uh, it's got 99.8% specificity. You can do 90 determinations and it gives you a uh, quantitative number called a sample neutralization index. And that can be anywhere from zero to 100%. And it's a fairly rapid test. Um, uh, requiring only 80 minutes to conduct. This is the basis of the test. So what we've done is we've expressed and purified the receptor binding domain uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And then we've conjugated it to, uh, in this case, an enzyme, but we've also conjugated it to fluorescent molecules um, but, and then we also express and purify the ACE2, the human ACE2 receptor. And the ACE2 receptor we have optimally coded on uh, micro titer plates. Um, the uh, conjugate is then uh, reacted with the ACE2 receptor on those plates. And as you can see here, we get a, a beautiful binding curve. Um, and then the assay actually is an inhibition assay. And so what we're looking to do is, is look for the signal that's indirectly proportional to the level of neutralizing antibodies present. And then we calculate the SNI percentage using a proprietary algorithm or uh, that we've uh, put into the system that I think is different than other surrogate neutralization assays. Um, this is a uh, this in it. This is some interesting data. I just wanted to show uh, how this assay performs. Um, on the left, you'll see a graph of those are monoclonal antibodies that were isolated. Um, well, they were the sequences were isolated from plasma B cells of COVID-19 survivors very early on by one of the leading virology labs in the U.S. And all of these sequences were then made into human monoclonal antibodies. And many of these are in clinical trials at some of the leading pharmaceutical companies. Um, but as you can see, our assay can actually differentiate the characteristics of each one of these monoclonal antibodies. That's how sensitive and um, differentiating this assay is. So you can see like the different neutralization profiles of each one. And then clone E is actually an antibody to the N terminal domain of the virus. And so you can see that that particular antibody doesn't really show any neutralization. The reason why we feel the immunorank assay is very important um, and could possibly be run in conjunction with our trace IgG 
traditional serology assay is because, as you can see in the trace uh, serology assay, we have a, a sample cutoff ratio and the, the high binders to the RBD are not necessarily always the top neutralizers. So um, we just wanted to present that data and um, we thought that it's a possibility that you may want to run the trace IgG in conjunction with the immunorang. Um, this is an, an this is one of our early initial correlation assays. This is uh, where we used a um, the surrogate neutralization assay versus a comparator assay uh, called an FRNT, which is very similar to a PRNT. Um, and this was some early correlation data that showed that our assay correlates very, very nicely with the live virus neutralization assays. Um, we feel that we have uh, done some things with our assay to make sure that we are able to detect both low neutralizing activity versus as well as high. So we have a, a high, a large dynamic range. And um, because there could be, you know, different levels of neutralizing antibodies in those samples. So it was important to us to design it to have that large dynamic range. We actually have an even larger uh, clinical agreement study going as we speak, um, where we're actually testing 75 negatives and 30 positives. Uh, as part of our EUA, our final EUA validation assay. Here's another example of just some data from our, our the, the immunorank test. Um, these are all, so we've been testing um, um, hundreds and hundreds of convalescent plasma samples. In fact, our assay is being used in one of the largest national um, convalescent plasma clinical studies um, that's, uh, I guess, centered down in v at Vanderbilt University, but it has multiple sites all over the country. And so our assay uh, can detect different levels of neutralizing activity in convalescent plasma. And um, uh, we think that that's one of the reasons why some of the convalescent plasma uh, clinical trials has not been as effective as they could have been is because when they select the, the convalescent plasma to infuse, they're not using a true neutralization assay to perform the selection process. Um, they're just using a binding assay. And in some cases, they're using a binding assay that uses the nucleocapsid as the detection antibody, which is even worse than, than just using uh, a, a binding assay that de uses the RBD as the antigen detector. Um, again, this is a just these are percent. These are this is just a bar graph of that's similar to the the line graph we showed earlier with the different um, strong elite neutralizing antibodies that are in therapeutic trials right now, and we're just showing like they're all pretty strong neutralizers. Um, uh, some of them like clone A is in a, a really, clone A and B are very elite neutralizers that have potential for therapeutics. Um, and then here's another example of some data that shows, uh, this was like, I think it was like a 100 samples that we obtained from the, a, a very large blood collection center in the New York area. And uh, we ran it on our um, trace IgG serology test, which again uses the RBD as the capture antigen. And we ran it on the neutralization assay. And there, as you can see, there's a wide range of neutralizing activity going on in these serum or plasma samples. And so like, actually uh, what's really kind of interesting here, and I'll go straight to this is that only 11 out of 100 samples um, had neutralizing activity 
that was greater than 75% and over 50% of the samples were negative. So not everybody is developing strong, strong neutralizing antibodies and some people are developing none. Their body is fighting the infection quickly in another way, such as maybe memory T cells or something like uh, some other mechanism. So it's a very unique disease. Um, but you can also see that the, the serology test is not 100% um, uh, correlating with the neutralization assay. And we've seen even less correlation with the binding assay compared to the neutralization assay in the convalescent, pl convalescent plasma clinical trial that's going on nationwide right now. And our test is being used in that. So, um, so basically some of the uses of this assay uh, or, or for screening convalescent plasma, uh, people are gonna wanna know post-vaccine what their levels of true neutralizing antibodies are. Um, it can also be used in, for post-therapeutic -therape antibody treatment and just overall population immunity. Um, like we kind of routinely test ourselves here at our company just to, to see if anybody has developed uh, any, any antibodies because we've also found that there are people literally going in to donate plasma uh, for not as non-convalescent convalescent plasma uh, COVID donors and like maybe they're just going in to donate for extra money. And some of those people are to actually testing positive for these uh, uh, immuno, I mean, for uh, COVID-19 antibodies, which is, was remarkable to us because it, was, it wasn't a super low percentage. So there's many people walking around with the antibodies that literally are asymptomatic. Um, there's many research applications, which would probably be less um, interesting to you guys, but we do sell a lot of uh, research uh, assays as well. Let's see here. Okay, so um, the benefits of this assay are really that it's a very high throughput assay. Uh, it's it, it's done on a, a an ELISA platform. Uh, it doesn't require a BSL three laboratory, which many people are just telling us how great that is um, uh, to to be able to screen uh, for neutralizing antibodies that literally has excellent correlation with the live virus neutralization assay. And really all you, the, the minimum you need is an ELISA absorbance plate reader that's uh, FDA 21 CFR part 11 compliant, although you can have very uh, high tech, um, high throughput systems as well. Um, so at the very least, uh, we feel that this has the CPT code of the serology assay. So forty-two dollars and thirteen cents um, would be the reimbursable amount, but we think that it uh, we we're in the process of looking into apply for a, a higher uh, amount of reimbursement. Um, but ninety plates is uh, if you're you know if you're getting that reimbursement is like almost four thousand dollars, and but we think at the end, the advanced CPT code filing that we're, we're in process right now is probably going to go through. And this assay is submitted to the uh, FDA under EUA 202866. And so is our um, uh, trace assay, which is the, the normal serology assay, which is under EUA 202828. And it is listed on the website. Um, so. It's an excellent, excellent assay as well with 99.4% specificity. It's also an 80 minute test and it doesn't use nucleocapsid as the capture antigen. And we think that's a big plus um, because it makes it more specific because there's less, there's less overlap with the common cold coronaviruses with the RBD than with the N protein. And um, it's it's highly sensitive and very easy to run. So, with that, um, I'd uh, like to end the presentation. But any questions are very welcome. 
Thank you, Pat. That's that's really good, and I, I do think um, we're going to see and hear a lot more about um, about the need for antibody testing that is more robust um, as we get further and further into this. So if anybody would like more information about the Lanco technology assay that was presented here, you can uh, respond to that um, that link that's on your screen. We did have a few different questions come in. Um, I don't know. That it looks like Agnes has some questions about um, convalescent plasma and, you know, the, the use of this assay saying, Convalescent plasma is not used for COVID. I do think I've seen, um, I might be splitting hairs or talking about semantic, semantics here, but I do know that it is, convalescent plasma is being used in many areas for the treatment of COVID patients. I don't know if you had any response to that um, as well, Pat. Her, her comment was basically that convalescent plasma is not used for treatment of, it's for septic shock only and not for COVID. Um, okay, so I guess I'm a little confused about that because like there's a there's an e, there's an approved EUA for use of convalescent plasma um, by the FDA for treatment of of um, patients with COVID-19 and um, there's also multiple clinical trials going, including one that the NIH just sponsored. Uh, at Vanderbilt University for like $34 million to conduct another clinical trial. And um, so I think it's, uh, anyway, I think, I think it is being used, but. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think uh, Agnes is confused, but uh, I, I agree with you that there, that is commonly being used. And um other questions that came up throughout the presentations, and I'm trying to tie these back to the specific ones, people had some questions about whether a mobile laboratory could would require its own certification. I think I addressed that, but just one more time, going back to the mobile lab could have its own CIA. It would need to be tied to a physical address, and so long as it was connected to uh, brick and mortar, it could um, have its own CLIA certificate. It also could be added on to the CLIA certificate of an existing lab. Um, so that's how that would look. Um, I think people had some questions on the certification level required to run that. It would be the same as running it inside of a brick and mortar lab. So no change there. But the mobile lab that was presented today is a, uh, I'm getting some feedback on my line. I don't know if you guys mind muting if you're not talking. but. Um, for the Integrum lab, that is a high complexity lab. And then I also did see a question come through on the saliva test asking which instrumentation that that would be run on. And that can be run, they asked if it could be run on a Quant Studio or if new instrumentation would be needed. And it can run on, uh, yes, the, the traditional PCR boxes. So on a Quant Studio would not be a problem for that saliva now, COVID now, or fluvid plus assays are all able to be run on that. So hopefully we answer those. Um, and then the rest, um, uh, is the ELISA immunorank patients run in duplicate from Frank Lee? Do you have any questions or a response to that, Pat? Pat, you might be muted. Um, but we have a question about immunorank, and they're wondering if that ELISA test needs to be run in duplicate. I'm not sure if you no. have any no. thoughts you on that. Okay. Uh, no, yes, the, yep. the test is ran in duplicate with the uh, the controls, but the samples can be run in single kit. Perfect. Well, um, just to clarify something too, on this uh, Linko test, it is um, under review for FDA EUA approval to be used. Uh, that's pending. The path forward in the short term, and this is my opinion, and you know we're, we're happy to have a conversation with what this looks like, is that it would need to be validated as a laboratory developed test. Lighthouse is happy to do that. So uh, if you did want to incorporate this uh, neutralizing antibody test, the immunorank test in your lab, we would need to validate it as an LDT at this time. And that's something that's fairly easily done, but um, we could have some conversation about what that looks like if 
if it's something that you guys were interested in. I think there is still more to come on that reimbursement code. I do think we'll see support for that um, from from CMS, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But your worst case is still at about a $42 price point, and I think it'll go up from there. So. Um, I thank you all for presenting. Um, this was super helpful information. Uh, I'm really excited about all this innovation, looking forward to seeing it become more prevalent in the market. Um, thank you to all of our attendees as well. If you have questions, feel free to reach out. We'll make sure that we get everybody connected. Um, and uh, I appreciate you guys sharing your lunch break with us and hope you'll come back for our next one. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining everyone, and we will follow up with everyone that we didn't answer to your questions yet. Thank you. Yes, and then also there will be a recording. We always get this question on each webinar. We will send that out to all the registrants. You will get a copy of the recording and a link to listen to this again. That includes the slide deck. So, All right, thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.